principal i welcome you all to the last session of this alumni webinar series a hearty welcome to mr vignesh pridan for raising this occasion from united states in spite of the time zone difference it's only 8 a 7:30 in the morning in ohio it gives me great pleasure to introduce mr vignesh pridan of alumni of the university he is among the highly talented pastor of civil engineering department he is feels a very responsible guy so it's only to the point not a word extra he is presently working as assistant bridge engineer cha consulting columbus ohio united states i'm sure he will reach greater heights and my wishes for the same now i hand over the session to mr Thank you, Arun sir. Uh, it's been special to come back to SVC again. Um, I wish I could do it face to face, but uh, yep, that's the situation now. Can't help it. Hope all of you are doing fine. Hope all your families are doing fine. Hope everything is safe and going on well. So, uh, just thought I'd uh, go through a few basics of bridge engineering today, and uh, it's a I didn't know much until I entered uh, my my job and until uh, I got exposed to the industry. So I just thought maybe it would have been better if I had known a little more about this in maybe in undergrad or maybe even in uh, my postgraduate. But yeah, uh, it's never too late. So I thought it'd be a good time to talk about this to you people. So, what's a bridge? A bridge is a, essentially a structure that uh, is built across an obstacle, but without closing it. Um, this picture might be familiar to most of you. Uh, I'm sure you guys must have traveled on it several times. It's uh, the Napier Bridge in Chennai that is built across the Kuom River. Uh, the most common types of bridges carry and cross either a roadway or a railway or a waterway and uh, in this picture uh, the bridge carries the road over water um, let's create a few more examples of uh, what it carries and what it crosses uh, so uh, the katipara clover leaves a set of road bridges which cross other roads uh, the two pictures on the right here uh, shows the the Mathur aqueduct which is located in Kanyakumari uh, it's uh, an aqueduct is basically a bridge that carries water uh, as you can see here uh, a walkway is provided uh, adjacent uh, to the water channel this serves as an access to carry out uh, repair or maintenance work uh, this particular uh, Mathur aqueduct uh, it's it's also known as a Mathur hanging trough. It has uh, it's become an important uh, tour, tourist destination in Kanyakumari, and the government is spending a lot on expanding tourism here. The Chennai Metro Rail Bridge is a good example of uh, a bridge that partially crosses water and partially crosses roads. Uh, the image on the left shows the portion where uh, the Adaya River is being crossed, and uh, the image on the right shows the bridge uh, crossing the, the Valapani flyover. Okay, so uh, let's look at a few basic bridge terms. Uh, bridge span, most of you would have come across this term in structural analysis. Uh, bridge span is defined as uh, the distance between two supports. The picture shown here has uh, one support on the left end here. I don't know if you'll be able to see my uh, mouse pointer, but uh, you can see uh, Okay, great. Thank you, ma'am. So this is one support here, and uh, there's one support here at the center, and there's one support on the right here. Uh, let's call them A, B, and C. Uh, so 
So this distance here between A and B is a span, and this distance here between B and C is another span. And this real life situation can be diagrammatically shown, can, can be represented by a free body diagram like this. So the, there are three supports A, B, and C, and the two spans here are marked 30 feet on either side. Okay, so bridge Q is defined as uh, the angle between the center line of support and the normal to the center line of the bridge. This could be, uh, this can be a little tricky to understand initially, but uh, if you look at the photo on the left, you would observe that uh, from a top view, uh, you're able to just imagine how it looks from the top, uh, the center line of the bridge and the center line of the road underneath it are not at right angles to each other. And uh, so that that suggests that the bridge is skewed. The diagram on the right gives us a better understanding of this. Uh, the bridge overpass that's marked here is this bridge. And uh, the intersecting roadway here corresponds to this road. So uh, imagine that uh, the person who clicked this photo moved a little bit to his right and uh, clicked the same photo. It would look similar to what's shown in the drawing. And uh, this, uh, so now, now that the drawing and the, the the picture kind of you know, makes sense to they align each other. Um, let's look at what the definition says. It says the angle between the center line of support and the normal to the center line of the bridge. So the center line of support is this, and in the, in the in the image it is this, and the center line of the bridge is this and it would be somewhere around here from top view so it says normal to the center line of the bridge so if the center line of the bridge is somewhere here normal to that would be this direction and the angle between them which is marked here in between between the two arrows here so that's this q angle okay now uh this slide uh, shows the different components of a bridge. Uh, let's go from top to bottom. Uh, the bridge deck is the surface of the bridge. It's uh, made of concrete or uh, steel. The road or rail or, or the water, waterway, whatever, whatever the bridge carries, it's built on the deck. So the, the loads that are applied straight onto the bridge are first applied on the deck. Uh, parapets are built on either side of the deck. Uh, these these are extended walls provided for safety reasons. They may be made of either reinforced concrete or steel. On important bridges or highways, uh, parapets are designed to withstand vehicular collision forces, and sometimes they are crash tested with trucks. Uh, the deck is supported by girders, also called as beams. Uh, these are different from the bent beam that's marked here. Uh, the bent beam is also called a uh, bent cap. We'll come to that later. But uh, so girders are the main horizontal support structure. Uh, girders are the girders are the main horizontal support of a structure. Uh, they are mostly found uh, to be I beams or box beams, depending on the shape. Uh, they're either made of steel or uh, pre-stressed concrete. They run throughout the span of a bridge and across the deck on the underside. Uh, actually, the next slide shows a, a clear view of uh, girders or concrete beams as they're labeled here. The, num the number of beams or girders in a span is fixed. Uh, however, there could be cases where uh, the number of girders are different between two spans of the same bridge. Uh, Go back and continue with the other uh, components. Uh, the bent beam, as I said, it's also called the bent cap. 
it's an extension of the column. The column, the bend cap, uh, are usually made of reinforced concrete, and they are uh, the design is done usually as one, as a single element. Uh, the abutments marked at uh, the ends. The abutments refers to it, it's the structure at the end of a bridge span on which uh, the whole bridge rests. Uh, single span bridges have uh, abutments at each end, which provide uh, vertical and uh, lateral support for the bridge. Uh, so in this case, there are uh, three spans and two abutments at either ends. Uh, usually made of uh, reinforced concrete again. A bridge bearing, uh, it provides a resting surface between the bridge deck and uh, the bent beam or the abutments. The purpose of a bearing is to allow uh, control movement and uh, to reduce the stresses involved. Uh, possible causes of movement uh, include uh, a thermal expansion, uh, creep, shrinkage, or fatigue. Uh, these bearings are usually made of elastomers. Uh, uh, we have footings which are uh, substructural components and they provide uh, stability underground. In some cases, uh, piles are provided to increase stability. Piles are sometimes battered or bent in a desired direction as you can see in the abutments they're not uh, they're not working uh, this this battering of piles is usually done to uh, provide stronger uh, connect with the ground footings are usually made of uh, reinforced concrete while piles are made of uh, steel sections uh, usually we follow a naming convention to depict the components we are referring to. We generally say uh, abutment one, bent two, bent three, and abutment four, based on the chain stationing uh, uh, of a project. For example, if the chain station begins somewhere around here and goes on this way along the course of the project and beyond this abutment, we name this as one and that as four. Whereas the chain stationing is reversed and the project starts somewhere here and goes on, proceeds this way. So this becomes our apartment one, this becomes bent two, bent three, and apartment four. So when we say abutment or bend, we refer to the whole setup which the deck is placed upon. For example, uh, when we say abutment one, we're talking about the bridge bearings on abutment one, this, the uh, support structure which is marked as abutment one here and the piles and when we say bent two we refer to uh, the bridge bearings on the bent the bridge bearings here uh, marked here the bent cap the footing the column the footing and the piles all of them together are called a bent so this slide uh, shows a cross section of a roadway with the bridge components. As you can see here, a uh, large part of the column is underwater. You can clearly see the load from the surface of the, the, load from the, surface, uh, of the deck is transferred to the concrete beams or the girders. Uh, these girders transfer uh, the loads to the pier cap through the bearings. The pier cap uh, transfers these loads uh, through the columns, the footings, and the piles into the ground. Okay, so now that we know the components, let's look at a few different types of bridges. A girder bridge uh, uses girders as the means of supporting its deck. Uh, the two most common types of girders are plate girders and box girders, as we just saw. It uh, depends on the shape there. Uh, an arch bridge is a bridge with apartments at each end shaped as a curved arch. Uh, the arch bridge works by transferring the weight of the bridge and its loads uh, partially into a horizontal uh, component controlled by abutments at either side.
uh, a cable stair bridge uh, has one or more towers or pylons as they are commonly known from which uh, cables support the bridge deck uh, a distinctive feature here is that uh, the cables uh, which uh, run directly from the tower to the deck normally form a, a fan like pattern or a series of parallel lines a suspension bridge has uh, cable suspended between towers with uh, vertical suspender cables that transfer loads uh, of the deck below it and this arrangement allows the deck to be level or uh, arc upward for uh, additional clearance for what's uh, underneath it a truss bridge is uh, one whose uh, load bearing structure is made up of a truss or uh, triangular units the connected elements may be uh, stressed from tension compression or sometimes both uh, sure you would have done a lot of uh, structural analysis with trusses uh, a truss bridge is economical to construct because it uses uh, materials efficiently a cantilever bridge is built using cantilevers uh, and uh, those are structures which project horizontally into space and they are uh, supported only on one end so yep one end is fixed and another end is free uh, for small bridges uh, cantilevers may be simple beams uh, but for large bridges they need to handle road road uh, traffic or rail traffic or uh, you know if or maybe even water if it's an aqueduct uh, the trusses are built from you know, structural steel or box girders um, a great advantage of steel uh, truss cantilever bridges is that uh, they can be easily constructed uh, with almost uh, little to no uh, false work okay now uh, let's look at the loads that need to be considered while uh, designing a bridge we have dead loads resisted by non component section such as uh, sulfate of the girder sulfate of the deck sulfate of the cross frames uh, so uh, by composite and non composite uh, what i mean is uh, so if it's uh, reinforced concrete uh, the steel and concrete together form a composite section and they resist loads together if it's just a steel section uh, or if it's just concrete uh, such a section which resists loads are called uh, non composite and uh, yep we also have uh, dead loads resisted by composite sections such as uh, roadway barriers and lighting structures we have the dead loads due to wearing surfaces and uh, utilities such as you know, gas lines or electric junction boxes which are uh, placed on the bridge there are uh, temporary supports and erection loads that need to be taken into account uh, as construction loads we need to consider uh, live loads from vehicles and pedestrians fatigue is also included in this category there could be a centrifugal force if the bridge is super elevated so uh, for people who might not know what that is uh, super elevation is uh, the principle of raising the outer edge of a of a curved road compared to the inner edge and uh, that is done to ensure that uh, you know a vehicle travels the curve smoothly there is a force transmitted to the deck when a vehicle moving on the bridge applies brakes and that force is called uh, the braking force and that needs to be considered here collision forces between two vehicles uh, or between a vehicle and a bridge parapet as we saw earlier that needs that need that needs to be taken into account too uh the wind loads acting on the bridge the wind loads acting on vehicles uh they need to be included too uh seismic loads which are caused by earthquake uh, also considered 
there are other generic forces which cause deformation such as uh, uh, temperature or shrinkage or creep or uh, settlement and they take into account too okay so let's look at what limit state is basically a uh, limit state is a condition where uh, beyond beyond the limit state the bridge fails to satisfy provisions for which it, for which it was designed uh, this doesn't mean that the bridge would immediately collapse uh, this means that it would start showing signs of structurally weakening uh, since we use steel as a major construction material in almost all bridges due to its ductile nature it shows a few warning signs before it uh, you know, fails or ruptures and yeah that that's the greatest advantage of using steel there are four uh, limit states that we need to check uh, service fatigue strength and uh, extreme event service limit state corresponds to you know, stress deformation and crack width fatigue limit state corresponds to stress strain cycles which is uh, the number of times a force uh, is you know it acts on the bridge it releases it acts it releases it acts it releases so once it acts and releases that forms a cycle and uh, over a period of time that contributes to fatigue uh, limit state strength limit state corresponds to uh, stability and uh, extreme event limit state corresponds to earthquakes and uh, other natural calamities based on these limit states there are uh, different load factors associated with the load combinations uh, this table is uh, from the ashto manual which is uh, the american association of state highway and transportation officials there are a few values which need to be referred to from uh, another section in the same manual like uh, you know you, you can see gamma p and uh, gamma tg and those values so uh, the basic concept here is uh, so now we have values for all the loads you know we have uh, if you can see here uh, we have values for all these loads dc dd dw eh ev uh, ll im all these we have values no, for all these loads uh, to check the load combination of strength one limit state um, what we need to do is uh, we need to multiply these loads with the factor which is shown here for example if we know that dc is uh let's say it's 100 uh newtons so uh let's say gamma p is uh 0.9 so that's uh 0 0.9 times 190 plus uh let's say the live load is another uh i don't know maybe 10 newtons so 10 times one uh, 1.75 which is 17.5 and uh, you know so similarly, uh, uh, we know these magnitudes here. We know these uh, factors. So when we multiply them, uh, we get uh, we get the value for uh, a strength one limit state. Similarly, for strength two, strength three, strength four, uh, extreme event, service, and fatigue. So as we calculate uh, one value for all these. Uh, just by the, the summation formula, um, we have a set of values here uh, from which we have to pick the highest value. Um, and that value would be uh, what we choose for uh, the design. This slide uh, provides more light on what these load combinations actually mean. For example, uh, if we consider strength one, it says uh, 
basic load combination, uh, normal vehicular use of the bridge, and no wind load. And on the previous slide, you can check that out. The strength one, uh, WS refers to wind on the structure. Uh, we don't consider wind load here. It's just basic load combination, normal vehicular use. So it seems like a basic load combination. There, uh, uh, earthquake, blast, ice. I don't think we account for any of those here. But if we look at strength five, it says uh, uh, wind load is included here. So strength five, we have a WL here. So uh, similarly, there are design applications for each uh, limit state of fatigue, of service, of extreme event. Um, so now that we have our loads, we need to carry out the design. For this, uh, we need to use uh, standard design codes. This would depend on where our structure is located. Uh, if the bridge is uh, if the bridge is in India, uh, Indian standard code of practice for the design of substructure and found foundation of bridges should be used, and uh, this link will lead you there. Uh, I didn't know that uh, I mean, I, when I was a student, I didn't know that there was uh, there were you know design standards for each. Uh, for different structures, I thought there was just uh, IS uh, 456 for reinforced concrete and IS 800 for steel. But uh, yep, you can just go to Google and search for uh, different uh, design manuals. Uh, and there's a there's a lot to learn there. Uh, the most important thing to remember while uh, designing a structure is to make sure that uh, the factored resistance is always uh, greater than the factored load. This is the basis of uh, the load and resistance factor design, or uh, LRFD. Uh, that just means uh, you know there's a, there's a load, uh, and we need to provide resistance or uh, you know, safety against the load. And the safety has to, always has to be greater than the load. That's what the philosophy means. Um, we need to check our structure for shear, torsion, and moment. In fact, uh, we need to check each component of our uh, bridge for all these parameters. You know, the deck, the parapet, the girder, bearing, the column, the bent cap, the abutment, the foundations, the piles. All these components have to be checked for uh, shear, torsion, and moment. Uh, in today's modern world, uh, there are softwares like uh, Leap Bridge, Open Bridge Modeler, etc., uh, to carry out uh, designs. If we uh, input load values and uh, desired uh, dimensions for the bridge components. However, it's a common industry practice to verify those calculations by hand and make sure that uh, the values we input were correct. Or you know, maybe just to verify that uh, the software uh, isn't doesn't have any glitch while you know doing this calculation. Uh, in some cases, uh, where the structure is extremely complex. Uh, might be difficult to calculate by hand or Maybe I shouldn't say difficult. It, it it might just take forever. Just say if there are uh, you know, hundred different nodes to analyze if it's a truss. Um, anyway, uh, we've come across structural analysis problems where we have three or four nodes and it takes almost two hours to do it. So that uh, and uh, if 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 a person working in a company takes so long for calculations, that means the company has to pay him for uh, you know, the, pay him for much more than what he's uh, supposed to do. And you know, they're not willing to take that risk. And that's why uh, it's advised that uh, in such scenarios where uh, you know there are, the structure is complex, um, 
only a few values are randomly uh, picked and spot checked that's a good way to uh, you know to verify that things are going on uh, things are still within uh, control and uh, it's uh, it's it's like a, a quality check kind of thing so, so yeah it's good to know that uh, we haven't completely started believing artificial intelligence and human intelligence is still the supreme power uh that's about what i prepared for today uh i know it's about a what sunday I prepared for today uh, i know it's a sunday. didn't want to uh stress you out so uh do you have any questions Okay, I see uh, something here. Okay, Vignesh, uh, this is Ruby. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, you, so okay. you have studied design papers here, right, with the IS codal provisions. So, how was it yeah. to study, uh, do your MS in structures and earthquake there? So, was it conceptual, or you had to study? the coral provisions there and how different was that i had to study the coral provisions here that was uh, that was a little different because uh, so here it's uh, there are different codes for different states for example i studied in new york state i'm currently in ohio state so that itself is a transition for me and uh, so there's a central code there's a, as i said ashto that's a central code uh, apart from that each state has modifications to that code for example certain certain states need to account for certain loads more than another state needs to for example a state in the south of us doesn't experience as much snow as a state in the north so the the, the factor for snow loads would vary so those kind of minor variations uh, are uh, are the reason for different uh, standards but uh, this transition from uh, indian standards to you know, new york or ashto standards it took time uh, uh, another major uh, you know a major thing that uh, i experienced was the change in units that was uh, because everything is uh, pounds and feet and you know, it's all over the place here so uh, i've come to a point where uh, i'm ready to use any units as long as the units are specified beforehand so. okay any questions from the students Yes, uh, Vignesh brother, I have a question and I'm, my name is Richin from third year civil department. Hi Richin, how are you? Yeah, I'm good. How are you? No, I'm fine. Yeah. Good. Okay, so our, our, we have two uh, methods of construction, right? Uh, like limit state method and a working stress method and ultimate uh ultimate load method and all so are the bridges built only on uh based on limit state method or they are still working stress method or something used anywhere so uh based on what i've done uh, i've used only limit state method uh, because uh, i don't know the manuals uh, one of the manuals that i refer to claimed that uh, this is the most up to date and the working stress method is uh, you know, it's it 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 doesn't uh, consider a few factors for example the lrft uh, let me go a couple of slides uh, back yep so the lrft philosophy says, says that the factor of resistance is greater than the factor of load so that means that uh, uh, let's say that uh, a load uh, let's say that we have a load uh, the factors for the load are always greater than one uh, if that's the case uh, we have a resistance to resist this these loads and we have a factor of resistance which is always less than one so okay let me give you give you a practical example of that 
uh, if a load is uh, say 100 uh, kilonewton, we have a factor of uh, say 1.5. That's 1,500 uh, kilonewton. That becomes the factor load. Let's say we have a factor resistance of. Uh, so our factor resistance should be uh, greater than or equal to 1,500. So if our fact if our factor resistance is greater than or equal to 1,500 and the factor is less than one, say 0.8 or something like that, uh, then uh, the resistance should be 1,500 divided by 0.8, which is more than 1,500. And that means uh, we need to provide greater resistance. And that's why the LRFD and the living state method are most preferred today compared to working stress and the other uh, methods. Yeah, okay. okay, thank you, brother. You're welcome. In the chat box, there are a few questions. So Harsha uh -huh. from first yeah. has asked, what factors do engineers consider when designing a bridge? What factors do we consider while designing a bridge? Basically, the loads. Uh, basically, it is. It's these loads. All, all these loads. It's. Uh, Hello, huh? where, where the bridge is located. It's uh, the type of soil. Uh, the type of. Uh, What else can I think of? So, and seismic zone also will be considered? Yep, seismic zone will also be considered, yeah. Again, yeah, that depends on where the bridge is located. And uh, sometimes it, uh, I mean, in, in India, most bridges are owned, all, all bridges, roads are all owned by uh, the government. Uh, I, I was surprised. Uh, to discover that there are a few bridges here in the US that are privately owned. And uh, so if that's the case, uh, you know, they actually don't need to uh, follow uh, any standard. So, but of course, they need to be checked and verified by you know a, a professional engineer. Uh, if that's the case, uh, there are a few uh, parameters that can be uh, that, that need not be looked at, that you can just drive around, so you can cut corners there. But though it's not recommended, uh, that's how it is. Okay. And uh, Hariharan from first year again has asked, uh, how will you calculate the load factors for bridge? So it's from the manual, right? Yeah, load factors are from the manual. Uh, so this is, uh, again, this is a picture from the manual. Um, again, it varies from state to state here. Um, Indian codes also have uh, load factors uh, based on you know, the type of loading and where the bridge is located. Yeah, uh, subsequent sub semesters you will get to know her. Uh, so next, Lalit has asked, uh, how do you choose in which uh, material you will build a bridge? Steel or pre stairs concrete? What? That depends on uh, the client again. Mostly it's the government that uh, takes the decision. So uh, what we do is, uh, most bridges are made of uh, pre stressed concrete. But the girder, uh, so this these girders here are uh, sometimes made of uh, pre-stress pre concrete, sometimes made of steel. Um, most of the other components are made of reinforced concrete. Um, but yep, it's it's uh, mostly the client that decides what the material should be, and it's the engineers who decide how we can do it with those with those materials. So that's that's where we come into play. Yogesh from first year again. What are all the difficulties faced while designing a bridge? What would be the major problem? The major problem is when something in the calculation goes wrong and we have to backtrack and find out what's going wrong. But uh, uh, 
other than that, I think uh, there are quite a few challenges in terms of uh, there are challenges at every stage from the time we collect soil samples from the time uh, you know we have a chain station and we kind of lay out uh, where the bridge is going. We kind of have an idea how the bridge is going to be laid out. Um, that's stage one. From there, we take it over to uh, you know, coordinating with the geotechnical team for uh, the report and you know, it goes on to uh, deciding on what kind of uh, materials to use. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, people design it and then I actually don't know. I'm not very sure about what happens beyond the stage of our design because I haven't been exposed to, uh, you know, going to a site and seeing what happens and how how things uh, are done. So yeah, that's one thing. Another major challenge is uh, most bridges are uh, though they are though they are you know they can function properly. They are uh, their service life is close to, uh, you know, their their design service life is almost reached uh, the end. You know, it's just barely hanging on. Most bridges in the world are like that, and um, so when that's the case, uh, I haven't covered that part of bridge engineering in this uh, presentation today. There's uh, bridge inspection is uh, a totally different ball game. There's uh, load rating involved. So in load rating, each component is uh, you know analyzed on you know how strong it is or how weak it is or uh, you know which particular component needs to be changed or uh, should it be changed, should it be replaced, should it be supported. You know these uh, engineering decisions are taken uh, at that stage. And, yeah, that's another challenge, and I haven't been exposed to that yet. So yeah, that, those are a few challenges. That I can think of. Okay, so um, how does one manage the? What is the lifespan of a bridge, and what, how do you manage to maintain it in the natural disaster areas? Zone areas. The life usually bridges are designed for a fifty-year lifespan to a hundred-year lifespan. Um. That's usually uh, how it is. That's what the code specifies. That's what uh, the codes are based on that. And uh, what was the other question? I didn't follow. Sorry. Uh, lifespan of the bridge and how are the cons uh, fact what factors are considered for the natural disaster prone areas? Natural disaster zone areas we uh, seismic and wind should be right. Yeah, seismic wind. There's uh, not sure what uh, these things mean. I'll have to refer the manual again. BL refers to blast loads. I think that uh, refers to uh, you know, volcanoes or bomb blasts or those. Uh, uh, I have to look at what the manual. I have to look at the manual to see what these things mean. S C E Q B L I C. In fact, uh, and get it right away. How long would it take to build a bridge? That depends on the magnitude of the project. Uh, that depends on the number of spans. That depends on where the bridge is located. That depends on a lot of things. But uh, just to give you a rough uh, estimate. Um, a regular two-span bridge, I think, from the time it takes to conceive the project in terms of, you know, how this is being done. To uh, from, uh, you know, okay, let's do this. To okay, it's all. I think it takes around uh, so a complete process from, you know, getting getting hold of the right people to do it. Uh, 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 Getting the data required for uh, the design, carrying out the design, uh, getting people to come to the site and work, uh, 
getting the work done i think it should take around uh, one and a half years that's my estimate Thank you, Vignesh. Uh, now I request uh, Richin of third year to give his feedback and present the vote of thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Um, so, hello, everyone. I am Richin John Charlie, third year Department of Civil Engineering, SVCE. So, it's my privilege to have been asked to propose a vote of thanks to our speaker. So, I, on behalf of the Department of Civil Engineering, SVCE, and all participants, extend a hearty vote of thanks to Mr. Vignesh Sridhar, who took off some wonderful uh, took off your valuable time to off your busy schedule and enriched us on the topic uh, basics of bridge engineering. Thank you, brother, for your interesting and glorious address. Definitely, we all have enjoyed the session throughout, brother. Especially, I like the way you made the contents so lively and simple. And I would also like to express a, a profound gratitude to our HOD ma'am, Dr. R. Kumuda, for giving us an opportunity to interact with the alumni members. Last but not least, I also thank Ruby, ma'am, and Arun, sir, for coordinating this alumni webinar series. And of course, I thank all the participants for your presence throughout the session, without which the event wouldn't have become a great success. So thank you all again. Yeah. I'd like to thank uh, Ruby, ma'am, and Arun, sir, too, for just giving me this opportunity. Uh, as I said, it's really wonderful to come back to SVC and do it. Uh, this is something that I thought I could give back to to the place that has given me almost everything. So thank you, ma'am and sir. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, really great when you uh, when we see our students coming up big way like this, and hope we uh, have further more interactions like this. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you so much. It is nice to see that uh, Dakshin is also here uh, live, I think. So Dakshin and Vignesh are uh, were uh, schoolmates and college mates. And now uh, they have been partners in this webinar series. So thank you, Dr. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, thank you. Bye.